Hi guys, well, it is turning into a lovely summer evening here. We are up in the piney woods and our seahorse in the pines. Tiny house hiding from the two-year-old and the five-year-old down the way. You're on this lovely, it is a Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. So as some of you may have figured out, I... <coughs> uh, I kind of put the my, my last video on the wrong channel by mistake, and oh well, don't go there. I just left it up. Uh, so this is really what I was going to be talking about today on Collapse Chronicles. Over here on Medium.com, we have a brand new voice. I have never heard this name in my entire life. It goes to show you, the Doomers are still showing up. This is a fellow named Andre Savinius Nilsson. Andre Savinius Nilsson. He describes himself. How does uh, Andre? He describes himself. He has 816 followers. 817 followers now. He calls himself a scientist by day, an aspiring writer by night. He is exploring the human condition 24-7 and is a futurologist in between. So we are going to start following Andre Savinius Nilsson. Uh, okay, I have a new voice in the Doomosphere. And so anyway, this man has done his homework. He has written... Good Lord, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, an eight part series. An eight part series in which he explores the collapse of modern civilization, starting with what is collapse? Why collapse is inevitable? When will society collapse? How society will collapse? Can collapse be avoided? No, it can't. What to do in the face of collapse? Get out there and enjoy it while you still can. Then he has a summary of it all, and finally this excellent appendix where he just gives you all of these links. So anybody just going down this rabbit hole, and, and, and I will tell you, if you have been down this rabbit hole for uh, quite some time, this is kind of a Collapse 101. I've heard the word primer and primer. It is an excellent, it, it, it takes a couple of hours to read all of this. So I was trying to, do I start with the opening one? Uh, my favorite one in a lot of, of ways uh, was, can collapse be avoided? Obviously the question is no, but what I'm going to do, this is going to be a spoiler alert. I am going to go straight to the summary where he summarizes all of this. So, particularly if you are fairly new to this subject and trying to figure out what in the hell these collapsitarian, collapsnik doomers are talking about, I highly encourage you to read this entire thing. So, uh, this is, so it's a bit of a spoiler where he sums it all up. Uh, all of the previous chapters, and even that's a long chapter. I don't know if my camera is going to collapse or not. Probably going to turn dark. So I am going to jump straight to the summary and uh, go over it, and then you can go back and read all of the individual chapters. And he, the this is titled. The End is Nigh, Societal Collapse, A Summary, where uh, Andre Savinius Nilsson just kind of sums it uh, all up. 
over the last months, plural, uh, this is why I have no idea how I haven't heard of this guy. Over the last month, I've dug into the nitty gritty of collapsology, the notion that we are headed for an imminent global collapse of modern civilization, while others have detailed our predicament in great detail and at great length see the appendix for a collection of resources worth checking out. And good Lord, I could do a whole channel based on his collapse appendix. I have written a brief overview of the topic geared towards the average reader that might not be too familiar with the rather sinister prediction that life as we know it is about to end. And then, uh, you know, he goes through, just briefly mentions and links you to all of the, uh, you know, the first six chapters, uh, which uh, I just mentioned. Below, I summarize the above six parts. Okay, so uh, jumping ahead, talking to an average person about collapse. This is how Andre does as good a job as anybody. Take it away, Andre. <clears throat> Consider your body a vast interconnected amalgamation of cells, organisms, limbs, bacteria, and fluids. A uh, colony of cells will love that opening sentence. A central government in the head controls all of it. We are, each and every one of us, remarkably complex organisms that resist the tides of entropy sticking together against all odds, well, until we die at least. To maintain our complexity, we need energy and building materials. In poorer nations, Many use most of that energy to stay alive and gain more energy. In richer countries, many have the luxury of expanding their capacity to acquire energy. One can build muscle in order to carry more firewood. One can use time to learn a new skill. One can gather non-essentials to attract mates, and so on. Thus, if an organism is an energy surplus, it can expand its reach. But the bigger the reach, the more it costs to maintain the organism. If the wheel of fortune turns, the system might have to shed some of its complexity. Sometimes the whole organism disintegrates. Modern society is precisely such an organism, and it has, with its interconnected product chains stretching around the world, grown large indeed. But we are now using more energy than ever before. If we suddenly found ourselves with an, without enough energy to sustain our global modern society, we are looking at collapse. Uh, there you go. As explained in part, so then he, so now he summarizes the, the ones I was trying to choose from. As explained in part one of this series, what is collapse? Collapse is the persistent decline of our global civilization into a less populous, fractured world marked by massively reduced societal complexity and technological capacity. In other words, collapse is the end of the world as we know it. By way of analogy, it's equivalent to all the parts of your body not sticking together anymore. While society isn't as interconnected as your body is, as mutually independent, 
losing the glue that keeps food coming to the supermarket will be painful, if not lethal, without all the specialized occupation skills and knowledge that we have today, how are we to create antibiotics, solar panels, or distribute food efficiently? The prediction is that, you know, by these collapsitologist uh, doomers, the prediction is that by the end of the century, we will not have enough to go around. But as the mantra goes, it will probably be faster than expected. That is exactly what it will be as the comment that I was leaving on another one of these uh, things from medium.com uh, just yesterday. Anyway, the future, remember this guy is a futurologist, the future is, according to the collapse narrative, medieval societies or Neolithic tribes. It could also be total Armageddon if the scales tip into a nuclear winter or hothouse earth scenario. The three most optimistic scenarios are high-tech dystopia, think Blade Runner or Elysium, primitive utopia, think Hobbiton and Lord of the Rings, or perhaps we can go to space in time, think the expanse. Most likely though, is a slow decline into a world wrought by unstable weather, local warlords taking what they want, and a phasing out of modern luxuries like plumbing and electricity. But is it inevitable? As I explored in more in depth in part two of this series, why collapse is inevitable? Yes, it is inevitable. There are three main reasons why collapse is inevitable. Number one, infinite growth in a finite environment is impossible. So you will hear, if you're new to this rabbit hole, you will hear this mantra. You cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet and one this global industrial civilization is 100 percent dependent on an impossibility can't happen something is going to give you are going to hit the wall the limits to growth so anyway number one most importantly infinite growth meaning in terms of population and consumption in a finite environment is impossible. If a predator eats all its prey, they will eventually starve to death unless they restrain themselves and not overshoot the carrying capacity. And good Lord, we're getting all of these glossary terms, overshoot carrying capacity. Anyway, just like a virus killing its host by being too successful, so will we kill the earth if we are not careful. Most species would propagate until they filled every inch of available space, but luckily most species face constraints in terms of disease, famine, or predators. Abstractly, we can consider such constraints as problems to be overcome. We humans found fossil fuels, stored energy for immediate use. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have used fossil fuels to do more work than we ever could using our hands. Fossil fuels allowed us to solve problems like never before. We could mine deeper, grow more, build higher, and move longer. But 
the amount of energy we are able to extract per energy unit we invest. This is a whole nother chapter and uh, Collapse 101 that he goes over in the chapter, the EROEI. Uh, but the amount of in energy we are able to extract per it energy unit we invest is falling due to lower concentrations of resources and diminishing global stores. It is, after all, the nature of finite resources. They run out. While renewable energy might take over, there is no such alternative for many minerals we dig out of the earth. In other words, we will run out at some point. When that happens, all the resources and energy required merely to maintain our status quo will be too high or too expensive. With oil production, this ought to really get people squawking, with oil production scheduled to peak in the next decade or two, <clears throat> along with phosphorus, copper, and many other minerals, it looks increasingly unlikely that society at our current level of consumption will last until 2100. Okay, number two reason collapse is inevitable. Destruction of the environment increases problems. Huh, imagine that. In addition to resources running thin comes climate change, pollution, and destruction of the very environment we rely on. Climate change will cause more extreme weather and change up the stable climate many agricultural re regions rely on. This alone will present huge costs in terms of energy and resources in order to solve resources that come on top of what we need for maintenance. Pollution and environmental degradation, such as depleting topsoil, will cause further shortages, which again cost energy and resources to address. All such disasters, from droughts to floods, represent stressors to our system. To solve them, we need energy. We can handle the occasional disaster, but once in a century storms become once in a decade storms. How long until we stop rebuilding cities? Then, there are the truly horrible events like the infamous clathrate gun, sometimes known as the methane bomb, that would more or less instantly tender our planet inhospitable to life. That's a whole nother rant. But even if we don't consider such dramatic tipping points in the planet's equilibrium state, just forget about those tipping points, we are still at the mercy of natural forces, even though we like to believe ourselves to be above the arbitrary nature of nature. In other words, maintenance, you know, of our status quo, maintenance cost will increase without a corresponding increase in the reach of our system. We could push further through massive collaborative projects, but these face diminishing returns. Consider the difference between one person, such as Galileo Galilei, revolutionizing astronomy, and today's efforts requiring teams of hundreds of scientists and satellites and massive obs observatories. Thus, problems become more expensive not merely to resist, but also to solve. Together, it means the whole system becomes more brittle. The number three reason 
collapse is inevitable. Our interconnected world is vulnerable to cascading failures. Given our huge maintenance cost and the rising problems we will face in the coming decades, we rely on a global and efficient supply chain to produce all that we need. Without this interconnected global economy, one nation's surplus iron can't be turned into steel in another nation's huge smelters. When every product we rely on, from computers to pencils, requires a huge, complicated machinery to be made, a failure in just one part causes cascading failures further down the line. So, when a severe drought cripples chip manufacturing, all kinds of technology production is crippled. Thus, one region's problem is everyone's problem. The financial crisis of 2008 is an excellent showcase of how we're no longer isolated islands anymore. In sum, we have built a complex machinery of many special roles and parts, and while we have lived in a climatically stable world of relative abundance, that is about to end. <clears throat> Expect that more and more frequent catastrophes will reverberate through society at large with less and less ability to clean up afterwards. But what everybody wants to know, when does it end? This is probably the most common question I hear with people just coming, you know, come, you know, meeting me as it were. When is this going to happen? My question is, it is happening. It's been happening since 1750. We are in the middle of the Great Acceleration. It is happening faster and faster every day, faster and worse than previously expected. The answer, when will it happen, is it is happening now. Okay, but that's not what people knew down this rabbit hole want to hear, they want to know, am I going to get out of here before the screen door hits me on my guilty ass? Okay, so for those people, the current prediction is that this decade, the 2020s, will be the last decade where most of us live in relative luxury. Some people are more pessimistic. In part three of this series, When Will Society Collapse?, I detail how it's likely that continued economic growth, as our current economic system depends upon, will be a thing of the past by 2030. A decade after that, otherwise 2040, it will be increasingly clear that things are going downhill. The long and short of why sooner rather than later is a combination of factors. First is climate change. It is highly likely, well, yeah, highly likely, 100%, that we will hit one and a half degrees C warming at least once this decade. I think we already hit it, didn't we? with no sign of our global CO2 emissions decreasing until 2030 at the earliest. According to emissions targets set by many countries, which they are unlikely to follow anyway, we will, we will see an increase in storms, droughts, cold snaps, heat waves, and other types of extreme weather that our society is not built for. Then there are the resource shortages. Everything from sand and copper to oil and fresh water is running scarce. Or rather, 
reserves are smaller and fewer or less concentrated, thus increasingly expensive to get from where it is to where it's needed. Couple the above with increasing poverty levels, topsoil depletion, and aging populations, we are set for too many problems to handle. And when a system experiences more stress than it can handle, it will start to break down. Collapse will be unevenly distributed. In part four of this series, How Society Will Collapse, I predict that society will crumble slowly with local catastrophes here and there. Sometimes events might synchronize in a slow at first, then all at once type fashion. Thus, it will likely be a slippery slope down the societal complexity scale marked with periods of seeming stability until the collective narrative shifts from an optimistic future to one of doom. When public trust erodes, likely to coincide with a bigger natural disaster or outbreak of war, collapse will speed up. Meanwhile, prices will increase and products will start disappearing from the shelves. More authoritarian politics will rule the day as a response to growing discontent. This will bring with it oppression, conflict, migration, privatization, or collective appropriation of everything, or even war. Hmm. For those living in rural areas that don't provide anything useful to the state, expect crumbling infrastructure as public money becomes scarce. People will flock to the cities for work, but with poor living conditions and high population density, pandemics will become a more frequent phenomenon. Finally, when the situation has crumbled long enough, the cities will empty as food stops being brought in. This is exactly what Jeremy Jimenez was saying in his interview a few days ago, that what we're still seeing is people flocking to the cities. Uh, but there is that, that model ain't going to last long, and then it's going to reverse. In the end, we will likely see many billions dead from hunger or disease or war and a drastic reduction in our technological capacity. This sounds pretty bleak. Is there, huh? 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 Oh. In part five of this series, can collapse be avoided? No, it cannot. I debunked most of the commonly held <laughs> hopes that we will be able to turn planet Titanic around, even if we haven't, as some believe, already hit the iceberg. <clears throat> And I'm, I'm not going to go through his review of Hopium. Okay, I'm not going to waste my breath. So, uh, in the original chapter, he, uh, you know, he really looks at the main Hopium uh, pipe smoking. And then he uh, summarizes, you all know, we all know what they are. Uh... The problem with all of these are time and resources. Uh, in addition, comes the resources needed to develop and employ such solutions at 
scale, at scale, if you're new to the collapse rabbit hole, this is a term you're going to be hearing. While something might work in a laboratory setting, in a controlled laboratory experiment, in a 20 foot by 20 foot room with 20 scientists controlling every little variable, try to take it to a planet of 8 billion clueless morons. Ain't going to happen. Uh, without massive collaboration between governments, and we're in, which we're seeing less and less of, and the funding to match everything, then he says, except geoengineering is simply a pipe dream or hopium, as it's also called. And, uh, you know, then we have the geoengineering thing, uh, which, of course, you know, is the one that might actually uh, do something. And what, of course, what it could do is the, the cure, you know, it's the frying pan of the fire. Uh, that one. Anyway, so, yes, there is always, uh, there is always, there is always, there is always, there is always, uh, 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 uh. But if that, uh, if, that, uh, if that hope is predicated on the entire world declaring war on our current predicament, then I would deem it extremely unlikely that anything meaningful will be done in time. So what does any of this mean? mean for you. And you know where I, I always end up. Okay. What does this mean for you? The coming collapse should tell you that having a rigid 20-year plan might not be practical as the local and global situation will become less predictable and more erratic. As I laid out in part six of this series, what to do in the face of collapse, you have in principle three choices. Number one, this is for, you know, the uh, preppers, the survivalists, prepare for future uncertainties. As the system struggles to keep up with the increasing battering it will take and a general lack of resources to repair itself afterwards, you will likely witness disruptions. The pharmacy might temporarily or permanently run out of a medicine you need. Coffee might become too expensive. Oh no. Or parts for your dishwasher are nowhere to be found. Here is, this is my dishwasher. I have all 10 parts of the dishwasher I was born with 63 years ago. I have never owned a dishwasher in my entire life. I've owned 21 houses, never owned a dishwasher. Okay, on the less extreme end, you can stock up for a few weeks of essentials and scale down the complexity of your daily life before collapse does it for you. On the other end, you can buy a farm or a bunker and go full into the wild. Your second choice, fight for what is right. This is the activist choice. Get out there and do something. If you are a clueless moron, who does believe the world is not a lost cause. Yeah, he didn't say that. If you believe the world is not a lost cause yet, go out there and demand change. Or be the change yourself. Become an activist, politician, entrepreneur, community organizer, or any number of roles that can enforce change. You could also gear up for helping those left behind by the growing inequality we'll see in the coming years, or protect the weak from op oppression by the strong. The options are many. You know, get out there and be an activist, do something, or sit back and enjoy the end of the world. For those who think it is all lost anyhow, 
or who don't want to fight for their survival once the shit really hits the fan, the hedonistic route is for you. There's not much more to be said about this angle. And, and again, even this guy, I don't like when, uh, I'm not going to get into this, when uh, I, I have never equated getting out there and enjoying it while you still can with hedonism. But uh, even, uh, I guess I'll have to talk to this guy. I do not consider getting out there and enjoying it while you still can to be necessarily uh, synonymous with hedonism. But anyway, another rant for another day. For all these options, however, it does not hurt to build a strong community around you. Banding together is your best bet when times get tough, if you want to push for change, or if you merely want to enjoy the end times. And that is exactly what we're doing here at Collapse Chronicles and all of these other Doomer channels. That is exactly what we're doing. We're building a community of like-minded people who can have this conversation without getting looked at like we have horns growing from our head. So what is his final conclusion? You might find all of this depressing and you won't be alone in that, so reach out to others. Talk about your fears, your huh. Talk about your uh, your uh, your uh, your uh, 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 oops, and how you might prepare or adapt to the coming calamities. What more can one poor soul do in the face of it all? Little, it's humbling, but also a reminder to appreciate what we've got and perhaps a prod to look at the world in a slightly bigger and more holistic perspective than our own immediate bubble. Humanity, humanity will most likely not go extinct, though, but it is unlikely that modern society as we know it will survive. How far we will fall and what the state of the earth will be once modern society is done for. Those are open questions. And so then he ends with a PS for anyone saying, after assuming anyone uh, would have made it this far, for anyone telling him, I don't believe any of this stupid bullshit. That's fine. I'm not sure I do either. All I've ever known is affluence and growth. Still, I am more aware now of the fragility of our global system, how the future will be shaped by climate change, and the likely political response to increasing societal stress. You can see that in in France. If you don't believe me, which you shouldn't, I'm just a poor side on the internet, then I can only urge you to check out some of the links in the appendix and judge for yourself the evidence put forth by those who actually know what they are talking about. And then he links you over to his excellent appendix for uh, more and more information to anybody wanting to go down this rabbit hole. So I do uh, encourage you to read this whole thing, especially if you're new to the game. But uh, I have got to wrap this up because the sun is going down, the mosquitoes are coming out, and I, I have some very bad news. The mosquitoes are coming out, but the lightning bugs at Bugs in a Jar farm have gone right down the toilet this year. I have no idea why the lightning bug population at Bugs in a Jar, I'm guessing, has collapsed 90 to 95 percent 
compared to the last three summers. I have no idea what this is about, but it's very depressing. Anyway, get out there and enjoy any lightning bug you still can, while you still can. We will see if the battery is still on or if I'm talking to myself. And you need your dinner. You need to go have your dinner. Bye, guys. I don't believe it. The battery is still on. Not one lightning bug in sight. Oh, boy. Goodbye. Lightning bugs in a jar. Hear that mosquito whining? Why don't they collapse? Bye, guys.